Um, welcome everyone to this uh, think tank talk. I am um, delighted to see so many of you on the screen today. Some people are still entering the room, um, but I propose that we do start already. Um, I am uh, filling in today for Maria Isabel Wieser, the head of the Think Tank Hub. Unfortunately, she is sick, um, but I am more than honored to, to fill in for her uh, with this amazing speaker that we have uh, for this fascinating topic. Um, I do hope that given this uh, sanitary situation, um, all of you are safe and healthy um, and still um, behind the screen. Um, so my name is Marie Julia. Um, I'm a project manager at the Think Tank Hub Geneva. Um, the Think Tank Hub um, Geneva was established in 2014 um, and it facilitates the involvement and evidence-based contributions of think tanks to policy discussions within international Geneva. Um, so by creating a dynamic and innovative place, the Think Tank Hub aims, um, uh, has three goals, um, disseminating, connecting, and hosting. Um, it is within this framework that we created the Think Tank Talk series. Um, I do hope that all of you can hear me well. Uh, I think that's the case. Perfect. Thank you for nodding. Um, I invite you, all of you to actually turn on your camera. Um, you are all muted, but it's always uh, nicer and has a more real life feel if we can see your faces. Um, and um, I'm happy to present also the Think Tank Talk series. Um, they're moved by uh, two goals, um, bring serious and renowned experts um, to discuss current and pressing topics, um, like today with Ivana Bartoletti. Um, and at the same time, allow participants to have a more active role and foster an exchange of ideas. Um, therefore, this talk is a unique opportunity for both speakers and the audience um, to learn from each other in an open and interactive atmosphere, even online on Zoom, given the um, circumstances. Um, but today uh, you're not here to, um, to listen to me. Um, today with us, uh, we have the great honor to welcome Ivana Bartoletti. Um, Ivana is a technical director, um, privacy at Deloitte. Um, she supports businesses in their privacy by designing programs, especially in relation to in um, artificial intelligence and blockchain technology. Um, she was awarded Women of the Year 2019 in the Cyber Security Awards um, in recognition for her growing reputation as an advocate of equality, privacy and ethics at the heart of tech and AI. Um, Ivana is a commentator also for the BBC, Sky and other major broadcasters and news outlets. Um, and she launched in May 2018 the think tank Women Leading in AI Network. It's a thriving international group of scientists um, and industry leaders and policy experts advocating for responsible AI. So thanks again for uh, sharing your expertise with us today, Ivana. Um, and on, all, on top of all of that, and probably um, most uh, important issue of the day, uh, in July 2020, um, she published a, a book, um, An Artificial Revolution on Power, Politics and AI at Indigo Press. Um, that is um, what uh, Ivana will talk more about um, during the next uh, 45 minutes with us um, in her book. And I'm not going to go into many details because Ivana will present it um, later on. Um, she exposes the reality of AI revolution from the low paid workers who told to train algorithm to recognize cancerous polyps um, to the rise of techno racism and techno chauvinism and the symbiotic relationship between AI and right wing populism. So very much um, in, the, um, in the air right now. Um, an artificial revolution is an essential primer to understand the intersection of technology and geopolitical forces shaping the future of civilization. Um, before I give the floor to Ivana, um, I want to add a couple of info. Um, so as you know, um, this event is recorded and broadcasted live on Facebook. Uh, feel free to share, feel free um, not to show your face if you don't feel comfortable again, but I invite you to do so though. Um, and if you want to share your 
contact uh, details with the other participants, feel free to share them in the chat on your right um, of the on the right of the screen. Uh, we will then collect them and share them with you um, as well uh, as the recording um, later uh, next week. Um, so even if we cannot meet and network um, in real life, um, we're happy to try to do that online too. So feel free to share your info uh, contact details. Um, you will be able to ask questions. Um, Ivana actually uh, welcomes uh, questions. So feel free again to share your questions in the chat. Ivana will address them um, as she um, And I think that was the last detail. Um, Ivana, um, thank you again for joining us today um, from the UK. Um, the floor is yours for the next um, 35, 40 minutes. And again, feel free to ask questions in the chat. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you for this very warm welcome and thank you everyone for organizing this. I, I still have um, the nice memories of coming to Geneva at the time and uh, at the university and have, have a conversation with you and uh, at a time where we could still move around and meet face to face and I hope that we can do that again um, on, uh, in the future. Uh, I'd love to come back and, and it's um, it, um, and I do miss, I'm sure you do as well, sort of all the, the conversations face to face and, and, uh, and the, the, but it's really good that although we are um, sort of um, uh, remembering those time with, uh, with kind of, uh, uh, sort of sadness and thinking that well, there was a time where we could actually all be together in a room, it's really good actually to be able to, um, to talk about um, what is happening right now and view this from the lens of, of the sort of technology and technological development because one thing and that, that is becoming very clear at the moment is that it, the, the COVID-19 and the pandemic has really um, um, has really um, increased the, the reliance on automation, the reliance on digitization, and actually those two are really progressing at rocket speed. And, and during the um, during the pandemic, we're all working remotely. We're all on Zoom. Um, data is un has been underpinning the, the digital economy for a long time, but in reality now everything is going at a much faster rate. Um, and um, it was only yesterday that there was an article in the, in the newspaper in the UK saying that over half of the local authorities in the UK are using algorithmic um, decisions to, to make assessments on individuals, cases from housing to education to, um, to vulnerabilities and, and all that. Um, and over the last few months, what we've seen with the pandemic is that our response to the pandemic built on the trends that we were seeing before. And the trends that we were seeing before are the ones that led me to write this book, but also to do the job that I, the job that I do, which is around privacy and privacy enhancing technologies and how we can safeguard individual's dignity in with the, as we progress with technology and the, the trends that COVID-19 is building on are the trends of datification when everything has to be turned into data and, to, and the, the trends of surveillance the idea that we are watched and not just by governments as, as you know we know that is happening but it's happening in the history even more but um, but also in the, uh, the, this alliance between between governments and and private sector organizations that have a lot of data around us and the response to the pandemic is building on that and I really wanted to start with you by really talking about what is going on at the moment and and share some ideas and please do put comments in the chat because I would like this to be a conversation if you if you really want to say something if you want to say something please just just come in there is a function that you can raise your hand on zoom which I like and I can monitor all this and please do share some thoughts because it's really important I think that we make the most of these conversations so one of the things that that I wanted to start with is the fact that when the pandemic started a few months ago there was some sense that in all the drama that we were going through but there was also there was also a sense that we were at the verge of building something different something new that we could leverage these dramatic situations that we're in to change the course of history and change the course of, of, of and change the way the, our economy works, change the way that the the sort of digital, the, sorry, the inequalities underpinning our societies are, and and um, 
on top of that we at the same time of that that happening we had all the protests happening in the united states where after the black lives matter um erupted as a as a global as a global movement uh, with the uh, extinguishing on, of the life of george floyd uh, which was the sort of visualization of 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 something that we knew that uh, we know that we know that and we knew that existed which is racism and and uh, and particularly against black people and and um and the combination of the pandemic, I think, and that pivotal moment where a lot of people started to take on the streets and say things have got to change, I think was a moment where we all thought, well, things can change. I don't know if you felt the same, but there was this, this in all the drama, there was a sense that we would not go back to how things were before the pandemic. And I'm talking to you now with a question mark, which is have we lost that sense? Or is that sense still present now with a second wave? Now that we're all a bit more tired, but there was the moment where we were really thinking, well, things can go on like that, this, this, and this, that applied to technology as well. Because what happened in May, in, in from March last year, I think, not last year, March this year, is that what happened was that people from across the world woke up to the politics of data and the politics of technology. What happened was that we realized that what was happening with Black Lives Matter in the US was really the realization that technology is not neutral in the slightest. Was the realization that things like um, facial recognition were used not as a way to, not as mere simple technologies, which that's a thing like it doesn't exist. I think like simple technology, but were not just used as, as a way to to improve security as they were claimed to be used for. But in reality, what was happening, what is happening is that privacy has become have become a sort of tool of control um, and even repression. Um, and I'm not just talking about the fact that facial recognition is a tool that is biased and is biased because it fails to recognize black faces with horrible consequences of, the, of the individual. But I'm talking about the actual deployment of the technology. And I'm actually talking about the actual deployment of surveillance as a tool to be wrapped around the most vulnerable in our society. And I think what happened with the uh, calls to reform the police um, coming from, from so the defund the police, which was coming from part of the BLM movement, but why the cause for reforming the police that, for example, embraced by Biden in the US, they, this called for reform, they were really thinking about this and thinking, well, you know, the way that we've embraced technology in particular over the last decades, that has been as a tool of surveillance rather than a tool of protection of individuals. And facial recognition to an extent all across the world has become the poster child of this topic. You know, the topic of technology as a social political tool of manipulation control. And I think this is really important. And the reason why I'm starting with this is because um, during this month, you know, we've really, the, the, the politics and, and geopolitics underpinning data have become clear to a lot of people. And that wasn't the case before. So on the one end, we had, we had the BLM movement. On the other hand, we had the pandemics and the idea that we could control the pandemic using digital tracing and technology, which is good. But what happened is that instead of talking about epidemiology, we started to talk about cryptography. We started to talk about data privacy. We started to talk about, which is great, but it did highlight a problem, which is that people were concerned and justifiably concerned that COVID data today may become surveillance data tomorrow. So what happened is that people realized that actually what was missing was the trust in the institutions handling the data. And it's unsurprising that that trust is missing. And that trust is what we need the most. We really need that trust the most at a time where to progress with tech and technology, we need a safe handling of data. We realized that we were, um, we were missing exactly that trust. 
And the reason why I say this is because people were worried about what's going to happen to my data, what's going to happen to, uh, to, to all this. And the problem is that obviously there is one thing that became clear during the pandemic and it's always been clear to me, that's why I went into privacy law, is that there is nothing more valuable as a collective asset than our own individual data. And the pandemic has made that clear. But why making that clear is also made clear that people really worried about what happens to their information. And you can't argue with them. You can't argue with them because over the last few years and decades, we've seen some really amazing use of technology and personal data. But we've also seen some really terrible, terrible things going on. Look, for example, at Cambridge Analytica in the first place. All the use of, of, of um, behavioural advertising to nudge individuals to the point that it's become unethical in some cases. So uh, the second element, which is exactly around the trust, that we, we've, we've really seen this erosion of trust and people were really concerned when all the debate around Europe was starting with the digital tracing, people were really concerned and said, what's going to happen to my data? And then what happened after that, we've had some real eye-opening cases around the use of artificial intelligence and predictive technologies to grade students and students' performance. It's happened in Switzerland, it's happened in the UK. What we've seen is that because in the absence of the, of the possibility to, to test the students face to face because of the pandemic, this testing was surrogated by algorithms using historic data coming from the schools as well as, as um, other proxies, including classrooms and, 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 and that led to what is fairly unsurprising, which is the fact that students coming from private education were graded better and a higher grade than students coming from state school. And that is because the algorithms were either because of the data that were putting in, but also because of the of the proxies that were using, they were discriminating against students coming from state education. So I would say that this became quite a mainstream topic during these last few months. What happened was that a lot of people realized hey, you know, there is nothing neutral about data and there is nothing neutral about technology. Um, and, and this is a sort of pivotal moment. I mean, this, this is a moment where we are a sort of cutting, sort of, we're in, in, in a sort of uh, a situation where we either continue to do what we were doing or we say, okay, we want technology to work for, for everybody. We want technology to serve humanity in a way that makes us better, stronger as a society, as, a, as countries, as Europe and, and European Union, as the world, as whatever, but you know, and, and to lessen inequality. And, and also if, inequality, if technology serves us to identify and spark these inequalities, then we can use it to identify we, where the, these inequalities are so that we can tackle them. So, or the other option is that we continue to do what we've done which is to use cosmetic changes to address big issues, often using technology to respond to changes as a cosmetic change rather than really address the real issues underpinning them. And this is what some people call techno chauvinism, which is the idea that you just fix some very strong social political issues with a piece of technology and you've sorted it. Problem solved. So, the reason why I started talking about where we are at at the moment in 2020 is because I wanted to kind of say, is there a way that we can continue with that spirit of change that we did have at the beginning of the pandemic, which was, yes, we, the world is, 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 you know, we're going through a terrible phase, but this is also highlighting and laying bare some really strong inequalities in the world, which technology, instead of fixing, is scaling up. And this is the time to really look at the causes of all this and use technology to work for everybody, not, not just to scale up the existing inequalities that we've got in place. So that's the starting point. Sorry, it's taking me a bit, but this is where I wanted to start. What I wanted to start is really to, to think about where we are at in this time, this, situ this situation, and whether we can go back to the sense that things can change. Now, I wrote this book because, from three different perspectives, I wrote this book because I'm a feminist, I'm a staunch feminist, 
And I do think that the issues around artificial intelligence and technology, they're not issues about simply technology, but they're issues about power. And we are in a crisis of power at the moment. So the crisis of power is because power is so unequally distributed. And in order to tackle power, in order to, to solve the issues around technology and to, and to really making sure that we're, on, on, uh, we're addressing the challenges that we've got, we've got to address the issue of, of power. And feminist and culture knows this really well. Because feminist culture knows that, that, it's, uh, that, that, that the power is what we need to tackle and the distribution of power is what we need to tackle. And this is why this is a feminist book, it's a deeply feminist book, because it talks about power hierarchies which are replicated in the digital economy, not just replicated in the digital world, but scaling up, they're scaled up by the digital ecosystem that we live in. And when I talk about power, I talk about the big asymmetries underpinning the digital ecosystem right now. One is the asymmetry between what we can do as individuals and what the machines that are deployed online can do. So we as individuals, we are the same people that we were uh, years and years ago. Um, the same people with the same feelings, the same, so the same feelings of love, hate, passion, sadness and sorrow that we had millenniums ago. These machines in turn have become complex. They are now able to leverage millions and millions of data and billions of data collected at every single data point that there is in our daily life, analyze patterns of behavior and understand correlations between phenomena that could be completely missed by a human eye. And leveraging all this and, and, and um, following our minimal sort of all uh, uh, every single browsing activity that we do online to then be able to serve us with with adverts news and all that now these machines have become very capable considering what we are as individuals but it would be wrong to say that these machines are some sort of superheroes they're not they are there are individuals behind them deciding what these machines are going to do but this asymmetry between us and as sort of individuals navigating the web because we just want to keep in touch with friends through Facebook or engage with people and, and um, watch Netflix or, or buy things on Amazon, which is all great stuff. But what comes out of that is, is that we are scrutinized, watched, followed by these algorithms. So that is the 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 power dynamic in there. And yeah, the other power dynamic is the power dynamic between control that they have over us and lack of control that we've got. So the first approach was as a feminist approach, this power dynamic, they need to be addressed and changed. The second reason why perspective that it is in this book is around um, privacy. And again, I started in privacy law years ago but I've always felt rather uncomfortable with the way that privacy has been seen, especially in the Western world. I do not really focus too much on what is own, my own personal data. I don't really think of privacy as some sort of super individualistic right of, of, of anonymity that I have to keep everything private about myself. And I don't think it works like that. I think privacy is a major collective public good that relates to the dignity of individuals. And in particular, in the age of algorithms, I see privacy and the right to have an autonomous life. And by mean autonomous, I mean not conditioned by recommendations, behavioral advertising, and online manipulation. Some of it is good, but then there is the risk that we are served news and exposition to, to the world, which is different for me that it is for you Marie and Fanny you know is, is is and we see different things and when we see different things I do worry about what is that we're sharing where is the basis of us being together in the world if even the basic facts are not shared in between individuals and we do not get access to the same news so what is the right of autonomy of the individual and when you grow up from a child, being a child, and algorithms, since a very young age, algorithms curate 
and edit the reality you're exposed to. And algorithms create this relationship between the past, the present and the future, because by looking at what you've done yesterday and the millions of data points and data uh, that you've left behind you, they collect all the information about the past, the merger with other data about other people and other data subjects, and, and then they serve you things they may like in the future. They create that relationship between the past and the threat, the present and the future that should be up to you as a person and not to a machine. So in this really dominant function of, of algorithms of organizing governing reality and governing people's lives you know where people's choices and freedoms end up being mediated um and restricted by these machines pointed at us we these algorithms have ended up playing a role of, of constructors of reality and being some real gates to what you're exposed to and what you're not exposed to. So to me, privacy in this age is around autonomy from all this. And where is the line between this power of algorithms and the individual navigating the world and making their own choices, not mediated by these machines? And when I say machines, I'm not talking about some divine thing. I'm talking about systems built and created by humans um so this is what i mean by privacy in this age and i would love to i know and i would love to have more people embracing this because sometimes when it comes to privacy law and data protection people say to me well yes is that privacy notice that comes online well i say to them well i'm like you i don't read it because it's boring <laughs> who's going to read the privacy notice? Who's going to navigate the internet and looking at every single legal thing that, 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 that you know, for as much as I, I read them when I can, but the problem is that this should not be the way that we enjoy the internet. The way that we should join the internet should be a way that where, you know, we are free to navigate and not bombarded, where we have the, not because we look through a privacy notice and say yes or no to a million different things, which is un just unrealistic. Where in the design of these systems, we have human control, but at the, at the heart of it, at the design of it, not by this so-called human choice of, of having to go through a million of tick boxes and say, yes, I want this or well, no, because we don't know what that is. As somebody was saying yesterday, you know, um, you can't have grandparents in control of privacy. You know, they won't be able to go through every single privacy notice and say yes or no and, and to, to, to whether they want to be tracked by a particular unknown company in this digital ecosystem. I want things to happen in the design because we, as a society, we say, well, actually, navigating life is very much what life is all about. And I don't want my reality to be edited, constructed, or gated by an algorithm. Um, so that's the second element is privacy. The third element is very much political. And when I say political, I'm not talking about political parties. What I'm saying is that I feel that the, um, we are responding with technology to issues that are very much political. The, and the, using technology to respond to all this is very much of a cosmetic thing rather than the courage to really say, well, hey, we've used these algorithms that has really, you know, laid bare the inequalities that we've got. You know, we are using algorithms to great students. We're really noticing using this algorithm that private schools kids are really valued and graded at a much higher level than, than, than other children. That is inequality laid bare for you. What are we going to do about it? But putting a cosmetic change to it is not going to be enough. The reason why I'm saying this is because I have the privilege to work with a lot of organizations that really do great things and they really want to get it right. And this is really reassuring because I think we're going to get out of this situation, a collaboration between sectors, not 
engaging in a war between organizations. I think, you know, the big public sector, big private sector, government, politicians, societies, we all have to get together and say, how are we going to leverage um, this technology so that they, they work for us rather than the other way around. Um, but the thing is, how are we going to, um, about these technologies, the key thing is, you know, we need to identify a way forward altogether and not just responded with a technological fix. And the reason why I'm saying this is because there is at the moment the attempt to say, well, you know what, we can fix these algorithms mathematically. You know, we can fix them. We can fix technology. And the reality is, yes, well, you can, but to a certain point. And I want to talk about one aspect of it, which is the aspect of algorithms being biased. And again, you know, that's a very much of a talked about issue right now. So algorithms are biased. And, you know, we know that. Well, what, does it surprise you? Does it surprise you that algorithms are biased? And does it surprise you that a bank is giving more credit to men than women? Or does it surprise you that, that, that you know, that, uh, that uh, black faces are not properly recognized by a facial recognition tool or that um, or that uh, kids coming from particular vulnerable backgrounds are, are deemed to be more vulnerable and more easy to, to end up in criminality than other kids. It's not surprising because this is what society looks like. This is society, society is like this. The problem with technology is that and the use of algorithms and machine learning is that not only does it take all this bias and codes into the system, codes them into the system, but scales them up to become the norm. And becomes and it becomes very difficult in the opacity to with which they are deployed, it becomes very difficult to challenge them. Even legislation that we like and we protect and safeguard and cherish, such as anti-discrimination law, becomes very difficult to apply that kind of legislation to an algorithmic environment. If anything, because you wouldn't know. Would you know? So algorithms discriminate. So why do algorithms discriminate? Because they're made by humans. Because they are ingested and they're fed and they eat the fed data, which is not neutral, but is the mirror of society as it is now. When I hear the, 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 the sentence data driven, I shiver. Data driven. I don't want a decision to be data driven. Because if it's data driven, that is probably unequal, fair and even racist. Because if a bank, without thinking too much, gives less credit to a man than to, to, to a woman than a man, that is it happened. It's not because, because the bank is, is doing something wrong. It's because historically women have had learned as less earning power than men. Therefore, when all this information about how much women have earned come into the, get fed into the, the, the algorithm, then obviously the outcome is going to be biased. Unless, unless you say, I'm going to apply, put some measures to stop this because actually in 2020, women earn more. They have a lot of capacity of earning. And this, regardless of the fact that, you know, we are still in a massive inequal, inequal world, world um, it's, um, it's not, you know, it's, a, it's, um, it's something that, that we can't just, you know, give less credit to women and to men. The same is happening where, for example, we use predictive technologies and in predictive technologies, we say so predictive technology is an element where bias becomes really complex. So predictive technologies where you use algorithms to identify, for example, who is going to stop paying, not be able to pay local, local, local tax or a payment back to, for a loan or whatever. Oh, predictive technology could be something like who in my community is more likely to commit fraud or to become a criminal. Now, in theory, you may say, well, that's quite nice because actually it's better to prevent rather than to really cure after the, the things have happened and intervene later. 
it's definitely going to be cheaper and you can help you. But the thing is, if the data that goes into the system and enables me to make this decision means that there's predictive technologies, they end up perpetuating what reality is right now. As a local authority, I may then end up having to wrap more surveillance around these vulnerable people because my technologies and my algorithms have told me that these people are more likely for historic reasons to commit crime. And therefore, I need to watch them closely, talk to them more closely, survey them more closely. What is the impact that this is going to have on them? Is this going to become a self-fulfilling prophecy? The reason why I'm saying this is because I do like what these algorithms are capable of doing. I, lo I do love what these technologies can do but I want to be fully in control of what the harms can be so I can address them. That's the problem. We Having these conversations doesn't make us anti-tech. It's the opposite. It's wanted tech to work for everybody and not just for a few people out there. So predictive tech could be quite interesting. I mean, there are so far, the, if, you, if you look at the recent Actually, I look at it today, but if you look at the recent Algorithmic Watch report, which is written by um, Algorithmic Watch, and there's this really, Alberto is, is accuses his name, he's, he's produced this, this really good document where there are only like two or three cases where we can definitely tell 100% that the machine is doing a better job than a human. And this is not to say that it can, cannot improve, it will improve, but we need to put a little bit of work in it. So the um, data is not neutral and data gets ingested into these machines. Data is not neutral because data represent society as it is now. And look, let's really get to the bottom of this. Whoever says that we just look at the data and this is going to drive our policies, you've got to stop them. <laughs> because data is not neutral, it needs to represent society. And I, I, I'm very strong in my book about it. I talk, I call about, I talk about data violence, but look, what there is an issue here and the issue is that if I decide to put you on a database and to decide not to put somebody else on a database I've made a choice I've made a choice and somebody's elevated to the subject of a data set and somebody's been silenced disregarded and is not in there for whatever reason that may happen but it's a choice underpinning data collection and data classification so we really got to change our approach to data and that is crucial especially in relation to race um, and we've got to really come out of the idea that that data is this sort of neutral thing divine sort of godlike thing that gives us wonderful insights in the world of tomorrow no it will not so to sum up all this and coming to some of the questions in here um i think it's the first thing that i would say is um the first thing that i would say is that we need solutions from a an accountability perspective um so um so we need solutions from an accountability perspective so <clears throat> these technologies are good algorithms are good in the sense I need to explain that in the sense that they can they can help us they can they connect us um, they help us um, do things in in an easier way although although that needs to be proved you know I, I start my book talking about the fact that you know um, since we can do shopping online and we've got everything smart at home I don't feel that for example, women's lives are becoming easier. It feels like we've become even more wonder woman than we used to be. Um, so, I mean, whoever says, yeah, technology helps, I'm like, hold on a second. It depends on where you are, right? <laughs> so, but anyway, so <clears throat> the first thing is we've got to, together with all the businesses in private sector, big companies, um, institutions, 
I think we have to agree on what due diligence in this product looks like. You know, what is this due diligence? You know, what is that makes this product ready to go in the market? And this is really important, especially at the moment where it feels as if it's more the glamour of a PR company rather than the actual utility, you know. So um, what is the due diligence out there? As can be made of standards, it could be, a, a, but what is the, the, do we need a licensing agencies, an accountability act as some are calling for, for algorithms deployed in public sector that have a massive impact on people life, people's life. You know, there are things that have a huge impact on people's life. In my view, you know, something that has to do with education, housing, health. I mean, those things that define your life. So if, if decisions are made by algorithms in these areas, do they need to be licensed? Do we need to be accountable? Do they need to be, um, do they need to go through assessments, audits? And it's not just about GDPR and privacy, because yes, I mean, GDPR is, is fairly important on, on automated processes. People who are familiar with privacy law will know that the, the meaningful information will have to be provided and all this. But let's be careful because the line between what is personal data and what is not personal data is very blurred in 2020. If anything, because the huge availability of data sets that make non-personal data becoming personal data later on. So it's very, so, so you know, AI can have very impactful decisions even on, on data that is not personal in the first place. So the first element that I see so in the questions is really like um, the, the, the structure that we need in relation to um, algorithmic accountability. So licensing agency, my view, do, uh, do we need, for example, something like when you go and buy food, you know, you know what the, the ingredients are or you know that there is like a body that has been checking that the product is good to go. Or do we need something like this? Do we need something about transparency of this particular technological product? And transparency to me means what um, the A now Institute in the USA, you know, transparency is not just the technical issues around how that specific algorithms work, but to me, transparency is where is the data coming from? What is the labor underpinning the creation of this particular product? You know, who's, who's been working on this? Is that thousands and thousands of people in, in, in the developing world looking at images and screening? Where is the data coming from? Is it coming from um, resources rich countries and but very uh, resources poor countries, like financially poor countries, but then you know, data rich countries, like some countries in, in Africa, for example, and some people are talking about data colonialism for their reasons, you know, so do we need some clear, trans, you know, do we need some clear transparency embedded into technology so that we as users, you know, we can look at the product and say, yes, you know, um, do we need, do we need to create a culture of, of fair trade, a cult, you know, in, in, in technology? Are we ready for this? Um, so that is in terms of accountability. I am very concerned about the lack of accountability. We are not, we don't have any tools at the moment in 2020. And there are lots of people working on it. The Council of Europe, they've just started a new piece of work around possible regulation. The European Union has been great. You know, they've done the AI level expert, level, uh, expert group on artificial intelligence, um, looking at doing a sort of a fitness test of current legislation to see what works and what doesn't work. And then, um, and then um, uh, with a view to deciding whether there are we need new legislation. In the US, we've got things like the Algorithmic Accountability Bill being proposed. The Future of Work Institute in the UK just yesterday issued an amazing report talking about proposals for accountability, including the accountability bill in, 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 uh, to, 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 to go through parliament. So, you know, we need measures for accountability. We need measures for transparency. I do think we need a public sector log of all algorithms used for decision making that has impact on individuals. So that's one thing. The second thing that I think is important is around um, around the idea of um, the idea of um, data and personal data in particular. So I think there is a problem with with data, which is around infrastructure. I mean, I, I see questions around this. I would really welcome a rethink of the way that we 
deal with personal data. And I do want, so we have, there's a big debate at the moment, as you know, the debate is, you know, do we, um, you know, do we consider personal data something that we own and therefore we can trade it? So is the question around, it's a question around, you know, I'm not getting anything in return from the data in terms of financially from the data that is used about me. So these companies are benefiting a lot of money, um, but what am I getting in return? Now, I'm personally really, really opposed to the idea of, of, of data as, a, as ownership because I believe that data is, is, is us as individuals. So I don't think you can sell a part of your body, to be honest, but that's, you know, my opinion on this. Um, I would welcome a different approach, which is a different, which is around the return that we get as a society from this data. Um, so for example, you know, if, if organizations are uh, using a lot of data coming from our public institutions, for example, hospitals, schools, what is, what are these hospitals getting in return, you know, um, and also can we think of new structures of organizing this data? So for example, can we think of, of data cooperatives or data trusts or new ways that I know I'm aware they've been, they've been studied and discussed a lot right now. So I think it's really important. Um, it's really important. Um, the, um, to, to think about alternative ways of, of structuring data. Um, I'm looking for the question here. Um, so there is an interesting question from Kaya saying, do you think we should simply outlaw human future markets, predictive markets? It's a really good question because I don't think we need to outlaw them. And I'll take, I, I want to sort of briefly talk about this. So there is one concern that, that I think is quite interesting, which is around the digital ecosystem we live in, and in particular, the entire operations that happen when you visualize an ad when you are online, you know. So if you open a website, you've been looking at a pair of shoes, then you go to another website and the same pair of shoes come, come pops up and say, oh, you, you haven't bought me, you know, buy me, I'm the pair of shoes. That's all right, yeah, that's fine, because this is around shopping and it's okay. So there is a limit to that, that's okay. But then what happens is that, uh, th what happens is that this digital ecosystem is called the real-time bidding process. And there's this system that is, is it this entire world that is behind the advert that you see online. I mean, there is a real bidding process that lasts like a fraction of a second deciding which advert you are going to see. Now, the problem is that what happens in that process is not visible to us. And that involves all sorts of data, including location data, which is very sensitive information. You know, you wouldn't go out, come, come back home at midnight, one o'clock in the morning, going through like, your local area. You wouldn't tell everyone where you are. You would just run home quite quickly. But in reality, if you've got a phone, you are telling the world where you are. You are broadcasting out very personal information to a myriad of organizations and we do not know what these organizations are. This is called the fabulous world of digital advertising. Now this needs a bit of rules <laughs> because at the moment it's very opaque, it's a complete data privacy free zone and it's really difficult to understand what that is. I'm very happy that the Information Commission in the UK just yesterday issued a great report to look in at the Experian and say, well, you know, it's a bit murky what's going on there with all this data. And it's really important. So I really, I really in, in, encourage all of you to read. But the bottom line is we need to decide what we're going to use these technologies for. So this algorithmic driven advertising, how far do we want it to go? But the problem is we need to fix the structure. The problem is the structure of the real-time bidding process and the digital advertising ecosystem is that it's too complex, it's rather murky, and it's like, it's like your data broadcast out to millions and millions of companies that you don't know what they are. So there is an issue there are really fixing that and having the courage, the political courage to do that. Um, the um, the um, other thing that I wanted to say, oh yes, there's a question here from Marcia. Where do you suggest to start when we need to speak to clients on, on this matter to take it relevant for them? Well, that's, that's a good question. I mean, I think things, I think we have to go back to what we were saying in, initially, you know, which is the fact that 
people are waking up to all these things. You know, there feels like people are waking up to the politics and geopolitics of data. They're waking up, you know, to the fact that, um, to the fact that, that, that tech not every single technological artifact is in, in reality a social political one. It breeds of, you know, what the people who created it, has got the values of, you know that it has the values of, of the of the, the people who, who created it and it has the um and and therefore you know it's not neutral in the slightest and i think people are waking up to this i think i think it's a matter of companies doing the right thing it's a matter of reputation it is a matter of of you know of, of breaching legislation in a way that we're not aware of yet you know as i said before you know for example, those days, you know, algorithms can be extremely discriminatory. The problem is, you know, we they could be discriminatory in a way that we are not even aware of. And it's very difficult to understand what the dis discrimination can be, especially when the discrimination is intersectional, which is something that, you know, we should really, we should massively worry about. You know, you can be discriminated because you are black and a woman, but you can be discriminated because you're a black woman. And, you know, in, and, and this in terms of discrimination is, is um, so discrimination is multidimensional, you know, it could be, a, it could be additive, it can be intersectional and all this is to detect in an, in an algorithmic advertising ecosystem, sorry, an algorithmic ecosystem. So getting it right for organizations is crucial right now. So having that, the, you know, by design approach is, is important because it, it stops from, from um, discrimination, for example, happening um, moving forward. Um, so I think, I think the, um, the main issue that we, the main thing that we've got at the moment is that, that and I'm going to close here, so that over the last few years, we, we've realized the sort of, just to sum up, you know, we've, we've realized the big power dynamics underpinning the global ecosystem, the digital ecosystem. And we are increasingly in a world where we are, you know, as, as Floridi says, you know, the philosopher, we are uh, connected and unconnected. So we are online and offline all the time. So we are like, somewhere in the middle because of the devices that we've got, because of our smart homes and all that. And because of all this, obviously, uh, you know, we, we have to rethink at the, right now, we've got to think about this digital space we live in. And the European Union is doing some important things at the intersection between privacy and competition law. There is no doubt that legislation as it is now, whether it's privacy, whether it's competition law, whether it's antitrust, whether it's consumer law, is not enough. So they probably, we need to leverage them all together to curb the power of some of these big companies to make sure that they give something back, like what the European Union is doing at the moment, which is you to the big companies, you need to give some data so that smaller companies can benefit of their data and grow as well, which is, I think is a great idea. Um, but, you know, we need to do this in a way which is not conflictual. I mean, I'm not somebody who is saying, oh yes, we've, we've got to close down a lot of organization. No, we need to work together now. You know, we really need to say, what is the direction of where we're to go in, in a situation where, you know, in a world which is constantly more polarized and it's a world where there is no doubt that the polarization is also due to the unfettered and unaccountable digital ecosystem that pushes pieces of information and pieces of news because they're controversial. Um, and there's little doubt about all this. So this is the time where, we have to understand the link between technology and politics. And if we don't, I'm afraid that we are not, then that technology is only going to be a tool to perpetuate and scale up the horrors that we've got in society rather than, than, than really help us challenge all that. I mean, I would love to say, right, okay, we've got all these inequalities, we've got all this, how can technology help us fix it rather than how can technology perpetuate it? if things are laid bare. I mean, this pandemic has laid bare a lot of stuff, a lot. As is, as, as you know, Black Lives Matter laid bare, what happened to, to, to George Floyd laid bare, the, what people have been telling us for a long, long time, you know, which is racism and white supremacy, you know, then, so now that all these things are laid bare, what are we waiting for? You know, and this is what I think is important to understand that technology is not, has to be is part of essential part of this conversation because we're not talking about something neutral but we're talking about social technical artifacts that breathe the life of the people who've developed them the companies that sponsor them and also the societies where they are deployed so you know as people 
sort of uh, incre increasingly wake up to the policy of all this, then I think we all need to join in this debate, every one of each one of us in a different way. Um, but we need to really force for more accountability, transparency, because we can't hear these things just because of the courage of a whistleblower in a company or because, you know, accountability has to be in the design so that we can, instead of having adapting to technology as we've done over the past few years, we can have technology adapting to us as humans and the value that we want to preserve. That was funny. Thank you so much, Ivana. Um, I'm reacting now with a clap on the on the screen. Um, I'm also clapping. Um, that was such an inspiring um, talk. Um, raised so many questions. Uh, I think uh, even more than um, maybe um, definitive answers. But we do hear, and we did hear this. Um, Call to join the debate, to ask for more accountability, um, to be more empowered, um, and really ask for answers and transparency in these matters. Um, I hope um, everyone got an answer to their question. Um, I think most of it did uh, the people who um, asked in the chat. Um, um, we will share. Um, the recording of this event with you uh, in the next few days. I'm not sure now if it's the right um, time to say if you want to know more about us, follow us on social media um, or Ivana on Twitter. Uh, we will share even more info. Um, follow the Think Tank Hub, Ivana on social media. We're really, really, uh, again, uh, thankful for Ivana for this amazing talk. And we're looking forward to um, hopefully meeting uh, most of you again in person soon um, or on Zoom um, soon again. Also, um, we will keep you posted about upcoming um, events and talks and lunchtime talks. Um, I hope you had a nice lunch too. And um, yes, uh, so thank you for uh, coming and we're looking forward to, to seeing you again soon. And thanks again, Ivana. Thank you. Bye.